with that. Open your Bibles at Genesis 15. Let me get my house in order here. Verse 1. This is the last day's message. Taken out of order, because I'm really on the church history part of the last day series. But I was getting a lot of questions because September 1st, 2010, so this will be dated, is when the White House in Washington is trying to bring Israel and the Palestinians to the peace negotiation table again. I'm telling you there will be no permanent peace until the King of Kings comes. And I'm saying tonight, Israel should put a bunch of no trespassers allowed, not only in Israel, but we'll, we'll, what we will come to see what was promised to Abraham. They're trespassers. And what we're asking Israel to do is to allow those trespassers Citizenship and a sovereign nation within a nation. It's dead wrong. It goes against everything that God covenanted to Abraham. And it's time for Christians to wake up and realize this. You ask most Christians that you walk up to, they don't have no clue what God's covenant was to Abraham. And what came with it. Let's just start with verse 1, chapter 15. And these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, if you would analyze this and go back at least one chapter Abram has to rescue Lot. In verse 14, I mean chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, you'll see five kings when a warring in this area where Lot was. And Lot was taken as a prisoner and Abraham goes and rescues Lot. Well, in that process, to make a long story short, because I don't have time to go through the whole story, you can read that chapter for yourself, verse four, I mean, chapter 14. To put it in a nutshell, to make it as simple as possible for you to understand, Abram and his men, you'll see it in chapter 14, Verse 14, and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. Literally, he led forth and instructed them that were born in his own house. 318. 318. That's an odd number, isn't it? Someday I'll get to that. 318 and pursued them unto Dan. And he did. And what happened? Literally, he kicked these five kings and the armies they controlled butt around. Does that make it clear enough to you so nobody is confused what happened? And he took everything they had. And then he runs across Melchizedek and in Verse 14, 19 and 20, he gives Melchizedek tithes of all. By the way, everybody interprets that just 10%. Uh-uh. All the different goods, including livestock, certain kinds of livestock, other material goods, 
he tied from each individual group of goods 10%. Because how can you, in our monetary value of exchange, here in the United States, we have, say, cash. $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bill, $20 bill, $100 bill. And you get so much for your labor. Say you're paid $1,000. You can figure out the percentages from that, the way we have our monetary value system set up. Back then, they didn't have cash. They didn't have the U.S. dollar or coin. It was goods. Goods. So if you had defeated your enemy, and say they had 100 calves, you gave 10% of the calves. What if they had 100 sheep? You gave 10% of the sheep. What if they had 100 pieces of gold? You gave 10% of that gold. You see what I'm saying, folks? 10 on top of 10 on top of 10 on top of 10. That's why you'll see, and he gave him tithes of all. He didn't say he gave him a tithe. He gave him tithes of all. And then we get to chapter 15. And these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. Don't you think that's kind of strange? That the Lord comes in a vision and tells Abram to fear not? Didn't Abram just do some serious butt-kicking? Defeating these five kings? Why is the Lord saying to fear not? I am thy shield. I could have preached an Ephesians 6 message on the shield with just this particular scripture. I am thy shield. Why would Abram need a shield? Why is he fearing? Because God responded in a vision by saying, fear not. You ever do something and you're so caught up in the moment, the adrenaline's flowing, and then after it's all said and done, it says, how did I do that? How did that get accomplished? How did I win? Say, for instance, in a sport competition, when you know your competition is far superior in ability than you. How did I pull that off? And when it's all said and done, in Abraham's case, uh-oh, I just beat these guys up. Let's make it simple, like I said. I just kicked their tail around a little bit. And I got back and took what they had. And I gave 10% of all to Melchizedek. Uh-oh. You almost can see. And you're going to see this pattern, Abram. And I'll prove it. Because it's so overlooked in this 15th chapter Abram's ups and downs of faith. Obviously, the adrenaline was flowing. He was going to rescue Lot. He trained his men, and he went for it. My mic keeps falling off for some reason tonight. I hate this thing. And he pursued them. And he caught up. And like I said, he, he kicked those five king's tail around, and took what they had. Now, after that's all said and done, and the event now is in the past, he probably was analyzing and say, uh-oh, what did I do? They're not going to be happy. Not only did I defeat him in battle, but I took everything they had. They're obviously going to regroup come up with a new plan of attack and come after me. That's the only logical explanation, folks. Why would God be telling the Lord, God be telling Abraham in a vision to fear not if he wasn't fearing? 
if he wasn't being afraid, if he wasn't terrified. Terrified of what? Because he gave Melchizedek 10% of all? He didn't keep any of it. When he gave the rest back to the king of Sodom. No. Because the five kings didn't know what he did with the goods. The five kings didn't like to get their butt kicked around and lose, and, and lose the battle. Revenge was coming. That's what he was thinking. Put yourself in the mind of these people. They're like you. They're like me. They're flesh and blood. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in the vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? He wasn't concerned about anything. That's what God was referring to. As far as material goods go, he had enough. Seeing I go childless. And the steward of my house is this Elazir of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given me no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. The best he could claim is someone else's child that was not born from his loins. He's childless. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Which brings to the second possibility or the additional problem and concerns Abram had. And the additional fears that God had to deal with encouraging and providing hope for Abram. These kings, they're certainly going to want revenge. And if something happens to me, I don't even have, which was very important in that time period, a male child to carry on the lineage. He even had a female child. He had no one. To carry on the lineage if something happened to him. Understanding that they might want to seek revenge and definitely get back what I took from them as far as material things go. So my life's on the line. I open up a can of worms. I'm allowing fear to set place in my heart or find a place in my heart and mind. And furthermore, Lord, if something happens to me, who's going to carry on my line? Think about it. Put yourself in his shoes. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Verse 5. And he brought him forth. How is this a last day's message? You'll find out in a minute. And he brought forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall, thou, so shall thy seed be. Obviously, this was happening at night. You can't look at the heavens and see a bunch of stars, unless the atmosphere was different back then, which I don't think it was, at least not that much of a difference, where you can tell and see and perceive all the millions of stars in, in the skies. Millions on top of millions. Billions. And he brought forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to... Number them. If you can count the stars in heaven, so obviously this is taking place at night. And that's important to understand because there's a couple of events here with a little bit of gap in time. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. If you can count them, what well, God is saying, that I'm guaranteeing you, your seed will be that. And what happened? And he believed, circle that word believed, he believed, he amened. This is the first time this word, Hebrew word, is even used. He trusted in the Lord and he counted, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He trusted, he faith. 
and it counted to him for righteousness. Paul deals with that in Romans 4, 3 and 4. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. First time it's used here in Scripture in this story. He trusts the Lord. He trusts the Lord for what? That somehow he's going to get a seed. He's going to get a child. And it's going to produce a number which cannot even be counted in a lifetime in the future. That's what he trusts in the Lord for at this time. Now, the Lord continues and says, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Whereby shall I know? Okay, I trusted in you when you said my seed will be like the stars in heaven. You can't even count them. There's so many. But okay, Lord, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How am I going to know concerning the land that you're promising? I understand and I trust in your words that my seed would be great as the stars in heaven. But now you're saying, and he said unto him in verse 7, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldeas to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it. He didn't see any land yet. He didn't see no children, and he didn't see no land. How am I going to know that I'm going to inherit this? Here he are. Here he is in verse 6, trusting and faithing in the Lord, and it counted to him for righteousness, meaning he was right with God at that moment. And then as soon as the Lord says the next statement, that he's also going to obtain a land to inherit, you see a little doubt, whether you want to realize it or not. A little doubt is creep, creeping in here. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He's questioning God. Okay, how in the world am I going to know that, I am, that I'm going to inherit it? Well, wasn't it just as believable? This statement coming from the Lord's mouth, a word from the Lord that he could provide the land, which in verse 6, that he came to a point where he trusted the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. He could faith and trust, obviously, for the children aspect of the promise. But how am I going to know I'm going to inherit it? What changed? What changed to bring a little doubt into the equation of the second part of the promise? Put yourself in his shoes. Okay. You're saying that I could do what I need to do to have a child. And you know how that's done. And I can see that. I know how that takes place. I've just got to make that personal connection with someone here of the opposite sex to see that happen. Now, my wife is getting old. I necessarily don't see that how that happens. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you that it can. And God just looks for a minor opening to impute his righteousness in anyone. That's how wonderful a God we serve. That's a wonderful Lord that we serve. That's why Christ is constantly looking for his grace to be flowing to anyone. 
that demonstrates any type of faith or trust in Him. He needs, needs us just a small opening for His graciousness to flow to our being. And I'm not putting the, what everyone calls the father of faith to the test here. I'm just trying to make him human as we are to give us hope in the midst of our doubts that God works with us if we keep pursuing and searching for him and his answers. For him and his answers. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know I shall inherit it? It's a question. He could have said, just as he responded in verse 6, I'm going to believe and trust in you also. I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to Amen, amen in you, so I can be no portion of righteousness, your righteousness in my being. First, for the first time, because of the stars of the heaven, is going to be my children, or is going, going to be like my children. You can't count them because there's so many of them. And the second, because the land. He couldn't see the aspect of the land part. He could put a plan in his head how... The first promise could come to pass. And in fact, if you know the story, he eventually takes things in his own hands and he has a child, Ishmael, which caused nothing but problems that came through a maidservant, Hagar. Not what God promised. That's not how it was supposed to go down. But that's what happens when man takes matters in their own hands and tries to fulfill God's promises for him. But you can see him putting his mind together and saying, "I'm, I, you know what, it doesn't seem possible. But he could physically put it through the motions of his mind to see how it still could be done. Because as a man, he thought he still could produce. Listen, every man probably thinks that until the day he dies. But he trusted the Lord in that promise. And God only needed a little opening to impute that righteousness in him so he could be one with him and, him and right with God. But when it came to the land, oh, wait a minute, that's a whole different story. So he questioned it. How's that going to happen? I don't have any now. Obviously, he was not too thrilled about maybe going fighting for it. He just went through a battle, and he got fearful over that. In fact, fear always kept creeping in. Remember he went down to Egypt, and he told Pharaoh that was not his wife but his sister to save his own skin? This is the father of faith. Hopefully I'm making it real enough to see how God can enter your life. There's no magic formula that Abram had. He was an up-and-down roller coaster just like anyone else. But through his journey, he started realizing that he had to trust and had to be obedient in the faith to please God, to be right with God. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? That was a little bit more difficult task than trying to go produce children. Think about it. This is going to take some time to think this through. And while I'm thinking this through, maybe you can answer this question in the meantime, Lord. Now, how did the Lord answer this? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, Every animal listed here in verse 9, by the way, is 
an animal that would be allowed or commanded by God to be sacrificed under the Mosaic law. In this case, that was still in the future. Everyone here is founded in this list. And he took him unto all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not, which was another aspect of Mosaic law eventually in the future. And he took them, he divided them in the midst. He cut them in half. That's what that means. He cut them in half. Take the goat, cut it in half. One half here, one half there. The calf, the heifer, one half here, one half here. The turtle dove and young pigeon didn't get the same faith. There was no dividing there. And this was a practice that would stay with Israel, even throughout the Mosaic Law. What has this to do with the end times, the last days? I'm getting to that. And I got to get there in about 20 minutes, so bear with me as I go quickly. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Even though there's no record of here, this probably led to an offering. But before it led to an offering, it was going to be an object lesson that the Lord was going to give Moses concerning the future. And there's a lot of you, especially from this verse to verse 17, especially verse 17, there's a lot of nonsense in religious commentaries and authors that have written about this chapter. They missed the point completely of what God was trying to do. This was an illustration of what was going to go down this is an object lesson. What's going to go down from this point on? And he took them. And when the fowls, in verse 11, came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away as he prepared what eventually was going to be an offering. More than likely a burnt offering. But before that, an object lesson. Guess what comes down? The carcasses. And what did Abram have to do? Drive them away. You should see Abraham swinging at the air, trying to fight off these crows, these vultures, the ravens. Trying to get to the offering. Trying to get to the object lesson. Now God obviously didn't come right away when this is done. He didn't come right away. If he did, Adam wouldn't have, I mean Adam, Abraham wouldn't have this problem with the birds. The birds were there trying to get to this carcass. For what? To devour it. To devour it. God did not come right away. But the crows and the vultures did. Isn't that the way it always is, folks? When you prepare to offer something to God out of obedience because you've been instructed through Scripture to do it. I'm talking about offerings now and tithes. Here comes the vultures. Here comes the crows. Let's put names on it. Here comes your bills. Here comes your past due bills. Here comes your mortgage. Here comes this. Here comes that to make their claim on what you put aside for God. Out of obedience to his word. They come in like vultures to devour it. They don't want you to present that to the Lord. Abraham had to take the responsibility to care for what this was, which was a visible sign of the covenant. These divided animals and the turtle doves and young pigeons that weren't divided. He had to take personal responsibility. The Lord came and gave him further instruction what to do with it. And you're going to find he didn't have to do anything out with it. The Lord did it all. I guarantee you, I'm having people now that had, listen, this message will be dated, but September 1st, 2010,
what you intend to send to this ministry in this month of, of September, I want those of you that intend to give to this ministry for the right reason, obedient to the Lord, to realize your responsibility in the whole act of the offering. Not just signing the check, but the whole act of obedience in where you participate and send that offering and tithe to. It's September 1st. How many of you? It's like, right by your head. How many of you on September 1st stop and wrote or made a phone call and said, this is my commitment for the month of September? And this is when I tend to send it. It could be multiple dates. It could be one date. How many of you took that responsibility knowing what's required here to keep us informed so we can budget out this month as we penetrate this dying world with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and everything else that we do here? How many of you stopped and took concern? And the responsibility. Well, I was intending to do that anyway. In this ministry, that's not good enough. Go to some other ministry and do it your way. In this ministry, I've asked you to participate not only in the giving of the gift, which is not yours anyway to start with. It's God's. But let us know at the first of each month, if you plan to send it on the 31st for the month of September, if you plan to send it on the 31st of August for the month of September, then you should have wrote it into August 31st. But how many of you even took the time today? Well, I didn't think it was that important. How many times I have to tell you that it is? See, Satan's trying to devour more than just your money. He's trying to devour your mind continuously and no one is an exception to that rule he's always on attack he's always trying to get to the offering he wants to break that act of worship that you have with the Lord and the way it's given to the ministry or church or wherever you're following and attending how it's done there Well, I got busy and I just forgot. How, how much importance are you giving it to it, that act of worship then? Or has it just become a habit? Write the check this month, send it off. Quite frankly, my view of it, as you're writing that check or creating that money order, and as you're placing in the money in the envelope, or if you send it online, A petition to God should go, let this be an offering that furthers your purpose and gets the word to the rest to, to a lost world that needs it badly. I told you that's where all the money goes here. Why wouldn't you pray for that? You don't support me. And those of you who've been around long enough know why. Well, you sound harsh. I don't know if I want to give to you. Then don't. You're not giving to me. I already told you that. That's why I don't want no checks written out to me. I have a different view on it. Nothing wrong on it with it if I ask you to do that. But I've asked you to make it out to the ministry. The ministry needs it more than I do. And when
when the fowls came, I'm not going to get this message done, down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Like I said, he kept the vultures off. And vultures and crows, whatever devouring bird in your life that tries to put the man what is God's is going to be there daily to try to steal it from your act of worship. Don't let it happen. Abram didn't. Abraham did, Abram didn't. Even though he was already, you could see the doubt slipping in about the land part, he kept being obedient. And he did what God said. And he was waiting on God. There's no doubt about it. And as he was waiting on God, he fought off the birds, the fowls. Well, I like this prosperity doctrine. Give to get rich and expect it as soon as you do it. Go to hell with that doctrine because that's where you're going to wind up if you believe that's not a doctrine from a bunch of wolves fleecing the sheep. Let's continue, because I want to finish this tonight. And when the sun was going down, here's another. At least 24 hours has passed. A deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a, low, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. A deep sleep. Kind of interesting word here that's used describing the deep sleep. It was used when God put a deep sleep in Adam to form Eve. That had to be a pretty good sleep, folks. Anesthesia was quite potent. Because you know why? In this case, one of the reasons God did not wait, want him to wake up from this vision, dream, or what state of mind he was in out of fear. He wanted to see him to see not only the beginning, but how it's all eventually going to wind up. We're talking about thousands of years of time. And he said to Abraham, no of a surety, no of a surety, a guarantee that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. That would be Egypt. And shall serve them. They would become slaves there. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom thou shalt serve will I judge, which he did. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation thou shalt come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. I already preached on this last time, I believe, I preached on a message in the last days. The Amorites is not complete. God in his grace was still giving an opening to the Amorites to change their heart. That was the Rahab story. Only one family came out of that. Isn't that kind of ironic? Almost like a Noah story. Only one family came out of that disaster. Only one family came out of the Rahab, Rahab's family. Not all of it, but most of it probably. God kept the door open for the Amorites to change. They wouldn't. That's the way it still is in the New Testament. In the time period we're in now, that's what Second Peter, don't turn there because I'm going to just... Read the scripture real quick and then move on because I don't have time to stop. Second Peter two three nine. Second chapter, I mean Second Peter chapter three verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but His long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Well, He's hoping for the Amorites. It still is hope today the man, for man to change his mind by the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They didn't have that back then, but we sure do have it now. In fact, it's more powerful the message than ever. More powerful than back to Abraham's day or the Amorites' day. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? To what? To repentance. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark and all this was going on, whatever he was going through in this deep sleep, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp or a lamp of fire, literally, that passed or literally crossed over between those pieces. Those pieces. If you look up this verse, you don't have it. Go to a Bible bookstore or a Christian bookstore and just read all the commentaries on this. It's nonsense, folks. They try to complicate this, trying to be super spiritual, something that's so simple to understand. What this smoking furnace and this burning lamp or lamp of fire was representing was the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire between those pieces, literally between two places. How do we know that for a fact? Only two places where you'll find the word, the Hebrew word here in the King James that states its pieces. It's geser or geser. Only, only in two places in scripture you will find this word, pieces, used the Hebrew word for it, geser. One is here which gives you a dark but a smoking furnace, a pillar of cloud, I've told you, and a lamp of fire or a burning lamp that passed between two pieces or two places. What other scripture referenced this particular word or uses this particular word? It's very simple. Any one of you could have found this out on your own by just doing a little research. Now in Psalms 136, verse 13, but let's back up to verse 11, verse 10. To him that smote Egypt and, the, and their firstborn for his mercy endured forever, and brought out Israel from among them for his mercy endured forever, with a strong hand, with a stretched out arm for his mercies endured forever. To him which divided What happens when you make a division? You have two pieces or two locations or two places. Which divide the Red Sea in two parts? The same Hebrew word is used here for the second time in Scripture and only other place in Scripture besides Genesis 15. With a, and what is it referring to? The Red Sea, sea scene. The Red Sea event in history that happened. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm for his mercy and do it forever to him which divided this Red Sea into parts. For his mercy remained forever and made Israel to pass through, to pass through the midst of it for his mercy and do it forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea for his mercies and do it forever. It's referring to the scene there at the Red Sea. What else was at the Red Sea? The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. That you can see in the Exodus story, in the book of Exodus. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and was dark, behold, the smoking furnace, which represents the pillar of cloud. Why? Because they were still talking about the fourth generation when they would Exodus out of Egypt. In verse 16, behold, the smoking furnace, which is the pillar of cloud, and a lamp of fire, which is the pillar of fire, that cross between those two places. What two places? What two pieces? The words only use one other location and describes the place, the Red Sea. It divided the waters. It provided the way for salvation and total deliverance from the bondage that they were under, Egypt, which at that time we represented Satan and his bondage. And that was the promise. And that was the promise. 
to Abraham. Yes, they're going to go through trials and tribulations, bondage and slavery, but they will come out of it. And in verse 18, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with, Israel, with Abraham, Abram. Literally, the Lord cut a covenant. Why is it supposed to be cut? You ever heard he's going to cut a deal or cut an agreement? It goes back for thousands of years, this type of thinking, folks. In the same day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. What kind of covenant? And what, what did he cut? That's what the animals was, was the illustration, the object lesson, as he divided those animals, except two of the animals that weren't. The turtle doves, which always represents the Holy Spirit, and the pigeons. In this case, the uh, young pigeons. And as they would, we would find this out later through biblical history, how they would, from this example, lay out this type of covenant agreement. In fact, you'll see it in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 34 even references, references this type of usage of a covenant-making transaction and what went along with it. They would cut animals, in this case, whether you're calves, rams, or goats, and along with the, the turtle doves and the pigeons, which would be what you would not divide because you, Israel would go on and abide forever. That was the whole meaning of not dividing those particular birds. That... When men, two men would make an agreement with each other, two nations would make an agreement with each other, and if they would follow the Israel practices, they would cut animals, and they would walk through the division almost like a handshake, a legal document. A notary public would seal the deal in our generation. That was the way they would seal the deal in theirs. Abram didn't walk through this covenant-making deal. God's the one to provide the deal because God knew that he could fulfill. Abram couldn't, but he could. Abram had to remain faithful, but God could deliver on his faithfulness. In the same day, and this is where we get to the last days, and the question was asked me, will there be a peace deal? If there is, it will be broken because no true peace can happen until the king of kings comes and set things straight, as I said earlier. No true peace. And the reasons why, because Israel will never have true peace because it is not claiming what is theirs that is promised by God. And what is that? The second part of the agreement. Not just the children that would come from Abraham. So many that it's like the stars of heaven, you can't count them, but also what was it supposed to be inherited by land. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant. He cut a deal with Abram. In verse 18, I'm almost done here. Saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt. Actually, from not the Nile, but it's a, another river that's at the border of Egypt. Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. A certain section of the river Euphrates. Not all the way to Iraq. Well, for instance, where Baghdad or Babylon used to be. Now, well, that was fulfilled only for a very brief period of time. It was never held on to. What do you mean? Solomon, for a very brief period of time, and possibly Jeroboam II, even briefer, not brief, I don't think that's a word, even, more, even shorter period of time than Solomon's hold on this territory. And I'm not convinced. Because there's some evidence that shows Solomon didn't capture or controlled all the ten listed areas in verse 19 and 21. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. It's never been totally controlled, I'm telling you today. This is a promise that God still will fulfill. And you're, <laughs> put yourself in Abram's shoes. Knowing all of these type of people, tribal 
nations, kings that control these areas and people, you too would question God. Back in verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know I shall inherit it? He knew who occupied it. The Canaanites, the Kenites, excuse me, the Kenzazites, and the Cadmoites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gigasites, and the Jebusites. A whole bunch of ites. I already preached on this somewhat. These are ten nations that are represented here, which not too further along in biblical history were condensed down to seven. Sounds familiar in the book of Revelation? Ten to seven. Ten to seven. This is still a promise that needs to be fulfilled. And a peace agreement is a hindrance to that fulfillment. And if someone's foolish enough in the Israel's administration to cut a peace agreement, even if it's only a partial peace agreement, they're off track and not connected. What God, and this is part of Torah, actually declares. Actually, what God has promised. And I've shown you on a map the ten different areas that this ites controlled, ten of them at one time, condensed down to seven, but still expanding in the same area. And I showed you how it surrounds all of the all of Israel, including part of Saudi Arabia, including Jordan, including Syria, including Lebanon, including Gaza, including parts of the Sinai Peninsula that is controlled by Egypt today. That's not been fulfilled. I'm sorry. It's still a promise. On the shelf, we all should be claiming, knowing that God's still waiting to fulfill it and recognizing that any peace deal really is only, it truly should be labeled no peace meal deal, P-E-A-C-E, -E, because it falls short what God has promised Israel. And I'm sorry, as we get closer and closer to the end time, the very last moment of this period of time, Israel is going to be in the center of the world's attention. Period. That's the way God intended to be. I will prove that out as we march along in this last day series. But for those of you who have asked the questions all day long, will this be the, a true peace deal? No, it won't. Unless the peace deal includes all these territories which these ites controlled and given back to Israel or are given to Israel with no take backs. Well, you go figure that out. If you think these nations surround and these people, these groups, whether terrorists or nations or organizations are willing to give that up, you're crazy than a loon. You don't know scripture, you definitely don't know your Bible. Get on the same page with it. It tells you what you need to know and what you should expect and how much closer it is to that time of God's complete word and promises to be filled completely. Now it's your turn to talk to me.